Good evening and welcome back to the Johnson Space Center for tonight's mission status briefing after a busy day in orbit. With us to discuss all of the latest on Atlantis' flight to the International Space Station is Kelly Beck, the lead STS-117 Space Station Flight Director, Keith Johnson, the lead Spacewalk Officer for this mission, Mike Suffredini, the International Space Station Program Manager, and John Shannon, the Deputy Space Shuttle Program Manager and Chairman of the Mission Management Team. And we'll start off with Kelly. Well, good evening, evening, everybody. We had a very successful day today. Uh, the crew started out their day with doing uh, preparation activities for the spacewalk, as well as uh, beginning the retraction of the 2B array. Uh, while Pat Forrester and Steve Swanson were getting suited up with the help of uh, Danny Olivas and Sonny Williams, um, we had uh, Commander Rick Sterko, uh, Jim Riley, and Lee Archambault. We call him Brew, so if I slip and refer to him as Brew, you'll know who I'm talking about. Uh, they started the uh, retraction of the 2B array while the crew was getting suited up. That actually went better than we had anticipated. Um, if you recall, we were expecting to have problems with the panels folding properly and uh, getting the, some of the guide wires hung up to, that would cause us to have problems with the retraction. We actually got further than we anticipated without the help of the spacewalking crew, and we got it retracted about 25% of the way um, before the crew went out the door. Uh, then we proceeded on, and during the spacewalk, uh, Pat and Steve then uh, got up to the work site and assisted with the retraction. And with their help, we were able to get it to just not quite halfway retracted. Um, they went out and helped us uh, clear some of the problems that were causing the array to hang up and not uh, fold in pro excuse me, properly. Um, so that went really well for us. Um, Keith's going to go into more of the details of the spacewalk, uh, just sort of the highlights. Um, we did get further than we had anticipated with the 2B retract. Um, we didn't get quite as far with the solar alpha rotary joint prep tasks that uh, quite as far as we had anticipated, uh, but overall we got a lot done and it was a very successful EVA. Uh, crew did, uh, they were outside a little over seven hours of uh, spacewalking time, so a um, lot of productivity from the amount of time they were out there. Um, today, uh, the mission management team did make the decision that we will be doing the uh, Ohms pod uh, blanket repair activity on the next spacewalk. Uh, so what the crew will be doing tomorrow uh, primarily is uh, getting prepared uh, for that EVA, doing some procedure review and having conferences with us on the ground to go over those techniques and the plan. And uh, we'll also uh, be trying to do some additional retraction of the 2B array to see how far we can get without uh, further assistance from the spacewalking crew. So on that third spacewalk, our plan would be to go ahead and, and repair that blanket and then also to uh, try to do some additional retraction of the 2B array. So all in all, very good day, and I will hand it over to Keith to give you some more details on the EVA. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Um, we started off the EVA uh, knowing that we had a problem with uh, the, the leader, and I have a, one of the leaders right here. Um, there is a spring that's at the base of this leader uh, that broke while it was on orbit, and that was noticed uh, by Mike Lopez Alegria on a, a previous mission, and when the spring broke, it allowed this piece to flip backwards and forward. Uh, what we were concerned about was that if it had a piece of spring at the bottom, um, it could get folded in, and then when we compress the, uh, the solar ray blanket um, during the retract, it could cause damage. So uh, we were concerned with that. Um, a couple days ago, the crew took pictures of this and they noticed that the spring uh, was in, in fact attached at the bottom, which was the condition we knew that we needed to cut this with. Uh, so uh, we reconfigured the tools to make sure we had uh, the pair of scissors and uh, uh, the correct tools to, to get this in position and to cut it off. Um, the crew was successful in getting that piece uh, removed. They put it in their trash bag and uh, they, they brought this piece in with them. So that's now out of the way. After that, um, we also saw from the same pictures from Mike uh, Lopez Alegria that uh, the flat connector circuits that are on either side of a solar ray blanket um, had tended to fold the wrong way and the problem with that is that they could poke out of the solar ray blanket um, when we're trying to, to compress it. So um, we had a tool that uh, we developed on the ground and you can see um, they call this the hockey stick and then it's kind of obvious where its name came from. Um, but this is uh, some Teflon sheets that are Kapton taped together. Uh, we're worried about um, circuit, open circuit connection and, and causing a shock hazard. So this tool is made um, completely non-metallic. 
Um, this was a, a tool similar to this, was built by Sunny Williams on board the space station. We sent her up plans to build this thing. Um, she constructed it. Um, the nice thing about this tool was that uh, both crew members had an opportunity to use it. Uh, it uh, Steve Swanson came out the door with it, um, and he went up and poked at it while Pat Forrester was getting onto the arm. Um, he was able to get the, the two uh, flat connector circuits that were closest to the, the mass canister. Um, and after that was done, he handed the tool off uh, to Pat Forrester. Pat went to the outboard one and poked that into position. Uh, we continued the retract to make sure that it's in a good position so that tomorrow um, we can continue the IV retract that Kelly talked about. Um, so we retracted enough bays that we think we're comfortable to get quite a few more uh, tomorrow. So that's what that, that tool is for. Um, once the, the crew got done with that, um, they went back to the airlock and hooked up on uh, the tethers that we headed out to the uh, S3, S4 uh, truss element. We started working on um, the br uh, Sarge brace beams. Um, these beams uh, changed the load path from a launch load to an on-orbit load. Um, while the crew was out working on this, um, they found that uh, it was a little bit difficult to get them in, but uh, through some teamwork and uh, some um, words from the ground, they, they got it into place, and so all four of the brace beams are in place. Um, after that, they went on to install the second of the drive lock assemblies. We had a little bit of, a, of an issue trying to get that in place, but uh, we finally got it where we want it, and uh, it's now uh, engaged and covered up. After that, they worked on launch locks. They got the remainder of the launch locks that uh, need to be removed from Sarge. And uh, the last task that we had hoped to do were the, the uh, Sarge launch restraints, but um, we saved those for another day. And uh, that's the, the completion of the, uh, the EVA for today. Mike. Well, good evening. It's uh, good to be here this evening. We, uh, we talked a little bit about the, the work we had in front of us last night and uh, uh, the team. It, it, it wasn't obvious when we're not doing things outside or deploying arrays. It's not obvious the work that the team is going through, but there was quite a bit of work to get the uh, S34 truss power system up and running so that we could hand over uh, the remainder of the loads on the, on the 2B array that we then turned around almost immediately uh, this morning and, and relieved the tension on, the half bay retraction I talked about last night. Uh, and all of that went very well leading up to that point and we did uh, uh, relieve the, the tension on the, uh, on the array this morning before, shortly before six o'clock. And then, as I told you, we went right into uh, uh, about uh, about 10 o'clock after the crew was up and ready. We went ahead and and started the retraction process. And uh, and Kelly's talked to you a little bit about that. But I, I will tell you about an event that occurred uh, right as we were beginning the retraction this morning. Um, as you know, last night Joel talked to you about uh, the Russian segment computers uh, having both uh, guidance navigation and control computers, there's three of those, or they're all redundant to each other, so any one of the computers can do the job. And then we have uh, command and control type computers, also, also of which have three computers, we call them lanes, and any one of which can, can do the command and control function. And then we have light computers on the U.S. segment uh, that talks to these computers. And so when we last left our heroes, we were, uh, we were on one lane each, and, uh, and the flight control team was off uh, uh, doing the work we talked about, uh, getting the, the system configured, then the crew went off to bed. Uh, during retraction this morning, uh, for reasons that are not clear to us at this time, we lost both of those computers. And so, uh, and, and currently we're in that configuration. The, uh, the uh, guidance navigation control computers and the command and control computers in the service module are not functioning. Uh, our Russian colleagues tried a number of, uh, of techniques to try to recover the computers and were not successful. Uh, they have since uh, stood down and uh, and gone off to uh, to meet with uh, amongst themselves and with our colleagues to try to uh, come up with some recovery steps uh, that likely will be attempted uh, when we start um, having ground passes over the Russian segment. As you probably know, um, the majority of the command and data that gets shipped back and forth uh, to the Russian segment uh, from the MCC occurs over Russian ground sites. The majority of those occur uh, on, on the early orbits. Uh, we talk in terms of uh, orbits, there's about 16 orbits a day. And, uh, and so in the early orbits, we typically um, come over the Russian ground sites. We cover quite, quite a few of them. And then later in the day, in the higher numbered orbits, we don't cover the Russian ground sites any longer. 
And so our Russian colleagues will will uh, wait to, uh, to start uh, coming over to the Russian sites early tomorrow morning and probably begin uh, the process of, of attempting to re recover those computers again. So where does that leave us? You might be interested to know. Well, the guidance navigation control computers uh, allow the system to control the attitude and, and provide propulsion if necessary with the Russian thrusters. Without those computers, we can't get attitude control from the Russian system. Uh, that's not a problem for us. The CMGs, in fact, are controlling the attitude and done a fine job today. Uh, they're very low momentum on the system, and uh, they've, they've, they've handled the, the stack very well. Uh, in addition to that, if they saturate, and you saw us do this yesterday, we can hand over to the shuttle uh, system, and they can, they can take care of the uh, uh, attitude control function. And in fact, we are working techniques to hand back to the CMGs from the shuttle verniers. Uh, we think we have a technique for that as well, and so um, so it's, that's not an urgent situation, but clearly we need to get this resolved before our shuttle friends leave. Um, command and control computers uh, uh, control things like the electron that provides oxygen, the Vosduke that scrubs the CO2, uh, uh, the humidity uh, scrubbers, and the water processor. Those are the primary systems that they control. Things like the lights, the fans, thank God the potty, all of those things are working. And so uh, the crew's in good shape because we have the Cedar up and running, which uh, can, by itself can handle almost nine crew. And of course, the, we have uh, plenty of LIO for the, for the balance of the crew, so that's not an issue. We have plenty of oxygen before we, uh, before we ever took off. Uh, we had done an assessment on the amount of O2 we had without an electron operating at all, and we had 56 days, which is, of course is way more than we need. Uh, so that's fine. We, of course, scrub the, the condensate on the U.S. segment, and, and uh, uh, that's fine. And we've got uh, plenty of, uh, of potable water for the crew to drink because uh, every day we get a couple bags of water from, the, from our shuttle friends. So we have plenty, plenty of, um, of the resources, and so we have plenty of time to sort this out. We have, in the history of the program, um, often had these computers go down uh, one or two lanes. We, it's not uncommon to be on one lane. Of, of each system and, and uh, wait for, for the last one to finally uh, give up and then the whole system reboots itself and starts back up. And of course what's unique is uh, when the system went to reboot itself, it wasn't able to do that. We are, uh, we are in meetings, uh, in fact I came from one to come to this meeting and I'll go back to it when this is over, um, uh, discussing uh, techniques and, and, uh, and options for uh, trying to resolve the issues that may be causing this problem. There's a number of things you can can imagine that we're looking at. Um, everything from the uh, external environment, the radiation environment. Uh, have we had any electromagnetic magnetic storms lately? The answer to that's no, unfortunately, but uh, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. Um, we've looked at the plasma environment. You know, we added a new truss. That's uh, that's more surface area. We also added arrays. Uh, which also affects the, the environment, the plasma environment around the space station. But the plasma control units are working fine. In fact, um, they're, they're hardly working at all, which implies that the, the environment is down where we would expect it, even though we've added this new element. We're looking for any new source of EME or EMI that we're not aware of. Of course, everything that flies gets tested for that before we ever fly it. The one that folks are starting to look at and scratching their heads a bit about is we did, of course, uh, add another power source in, in the form of the S34 truss, and so we're off to look to see if there's anything about that power source that may have uh, affected the ability, that may make it slightly different for reasons that aren't clear, uh, the power quality coming from that element that may have affected the ability, the ability of these computers to operate correctly. And then, of course, on the Russian segment, there's a number of, of things our Russian uh, colleagues will look at as well to see if they can figure it out. Um, so we're, we're working through those options tonight. Uh, we'll begin in earnest tomorrow morning to try techniques to recover these computers. I fully expect us to be able to do this. Um, I, I'm, not, uh, I, I'm not thinking this isn't something that we, that we will not recover from. But in the meantime, uh, being NASA and the fact that we, uh, we try to do everything we can to protect every, every option, uh, we are looking at options to, to extend the, the time that the shuttle guys stay with us, just in case we'd like an extra day or so. We can't extend it much, but we're certainly looking at that. Uh, we're also looking at a number of different options, how we conserve pr 
prop if we decide we need uh, more attitude control help from our shuttle colleagues than we had originally planned. Uh, so we're looking at how we manage uh, uh, the, the uh, propellant, the, uh, the O2, and uh, any of the other resources necessary to see if we can extend a little bit longer if we need to. Uh, so that's the position we're in today. The vehicle's fine. Um, and, uh, and like I said, tomorrow I would expect uh, this time tomorrow night we'll be telling you uh, about our, our steps that got us at least one lane in each system up and running. Uh, and if not, uh, how we continue to lead uh, toward that uh, position. So that's where we're at today. Overall, the ISS has done very well. As Kelly has mentioned, her team has done a fabulous job of getting us where we are today. Uh, the systems on whole have worked very well, and so we're very we're very uh, happy with the performance of the S34 truss as we brought it up. And uh, as she said, from a retraction standpoint, I sat here and told you last night, and even though Joel's line said that it was going to be retracted by 146 today, we told you that the plan was set up to give us several days to retract your rays, and I suspect uh, by the time we're done with our EVAs, we'll have it uh, we'll have it in the box. And so, the to from our perspective, the mission's gone very well in that respect. And that's all I have. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've been coming in and telling you how the MMTs have been going, the mission management team. And we met for about four hours today. It was fairly long. Uh, we spent two and a half of those hours going over the operations and uh, spacewalk engineers' plans on repairing the torn Ohm's pod blanket. And uh, we did pick one uh, repair method. All of these repair methods were assessed by crew members that had been out on spacewalks before. And the uh, method we came up with was uh, they were highly confident is how they rated it, that it would be successful and uh, something that could, uh, could be done. We also took a look at our testing, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. And it, uh, it also was, uh, was supporting very well. Uh, so we, uh, we decided that the, the best course of action was to go ahead and try and edit on EVA3 on Friday. And, uh, and that's what we asked the ops team to go look at. Let's go to the uh, first first picture. This is just to reorient you. This is a picture that was taken from Space Station. It gives a little better view of the um, of the Ohm's pod blanket. And you can see not just the, the little corner, the little four by six inch triangular piece that is uh, that is up, but the blanket right next to us to it, the one that's closest to you in the picture, also is pulled back a little bit from the tile. And we're going to address that as well. Uh, the repair method that uh, that they chose that uh, the MMT agreed with, the first step is that when the astronaut gets out there on the shuttle remote manipulator system, they'll pat down the blanket. And go to the next uh, chart, please. Uh, and they can either use their, uh, their gloved hands or we have a, a tool. It's actually a scraper tool that you would use if you were going to do some other type of TPS repair. Uh, to go ahead and, and, uh, and tamp it down. These blankets are very formable. If, um, uh, if you remember the other day, the memory on that blanket, it will take the shape that you put it in and pretty much stay there. So, so we think we'll be able to push it down and it'll, it'll stay in the, uh, in the slot very well. The uh, next step that the, um, the astronaut would do is we're going to put a double row of staples. Go to the next uh, chart, please. Uh, at the bottom of the uh, blankets, you'll attach them with this medical stapler and uh, then you'll pull it together and at the top row you can uh, you can run a row of staples. These are not your average office supply staplers. I have uh, one here, it's, a, it's called a medical stapler. Each one of these uh, holds 15 stainless steel staples. That's hard to say. And uh, it's just actuated by, by pushing down on this and just like you would think if you were if you were trying to close a wound, uh, you don't have to use very much pressure as the staple goes in. It kind of has hooks that go in to the uh, into the blanket in this case, and uh, provides a very very tight bond. A normal staple, you would think you you know you can kind of bend it and twist it around. These staples are, are more like little fish hooks. They're very hard to uh, very hard to uh, to change their shape, and they're also stainless steel, so that provides you uh, quite a bit of not just strength but heat resistance as well. So after the crew staples it and and attaches one blanket to the uh, to the neighboring blanket. They're going to attach it to the tile that's directly in front of it. Let's go to the next one. And they will use uh, use two things. Uh, one is a um, a nickel chromium pin that was developed uh, in tile repair application. Uh, if we had a big gouge in a tile, we take these bags of insulation and pin them to the tile, and then put this overlay over the top of it. Well, we use those pins because they're they're heat resistant and they're very good at going in tile. And if you can come back to me, I'll show you here. Here's the, 
Here's the pin. It's just a very straightforward piece of wire, but it's, it's, very, it's very stiff. It's kind of hard to bend. And what they'll do, we have a little mock-up over here, is uh, they'll take this, uh, this dental tool. It's just a, just a piece of metal with a little, little probe on it. And I'll wait for the camera over here. You can go over. There we go. Uh, this is just the, the tile. And you can see if you, if you try to, the pin, it's, it's kind of hard to, to push into when I'm kind of doing it. But what the crew will do is they'll just take this and they'll score the tile a little bit. And it's very easy just to push right in. And it stays pretty well. Um, so with, with that tool and that pin, uh, we think we'll be able to very easily secure the front of the blanket to the tile and not have any gap in there to let any, any airflow get in. If, uh, if for some reason we're surprised and the, uh, the blanket is not in as good a shape as we think it is, uh, another method was, uh, was suggested, and uh, this is the stitching repair method where they use that, uh, that long curved needle that has some stainless steel wire attached to it to, to stitch it up. I think the likelihood of actually having to use this is very low. All of the astronauts that tried using the stapler were highly confident that, uh, that it would work, but this will be a backup capability for us as well. You go to the next chart just shows a little, little better picture of that uh, dental elevator, which is just a, just a metal probe that we can use to, um, to put a hole down through the blanket or a, a small hole in the towel to push the pin through. Uh, we spent a great deal of time uh, today talking about the test schedule and, uh, and what we want to do to prove to ourselves that what we're going to do is going to be effective. Let's go to the next chart. Uh, the first thing we did, and this is all complete, is the pull test. We took the different options, one of just pushing the blanket down and leaving it, not doing anything to secure it, the staples, staples with pins, the stitching, stitching with pins, stitching with staples with pins. They did all of them. And uh, they put a, uh, a small bladder underneath the blanket and would pump it up to see how much force it could take. And that was supposed to simulate air getting underneath the blanket and pushing it up. All that was done, it was, uh, the team was very confident that the staples with the pins would, would meet our objectives. Uh, we do have a, a mock-up going to the ArcJet facility. And uh, that's going to, uh, to be tested uh, late Thursday. And the reason for that is we have these stainless steel staples and these nickel chromium pins. They will see an environment of up to 1,000 degrees. It'll be somewhere between 700 and 1,000 degrees. So we'll, we'll do the repair on a blanket with the real staples and the real pins, put it in the arc jet, and run it through a simulated entry profile. Because even though stainless steel melts at about 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and it won't see near that, it will degrade the metal's capability. So we're going to put that in the arc jet. We're going to put it through an entry environment. And then we're going to take it over to a wind tunnel at Texas A&M and hit it with the uh, dynamic pressure that's expected during entry and see how the, uh, the degraded metal and the staples and the pins holds up. We expect it to be, to be very successful and not to have any problems at all. But that's the wind tunnel test that we're going to do. Then if, uh, if everything we did was, was wrong or if you know, for some reason we weren't successful and we got heat down there, I've said a couple of days in a row that, that we don't have very much understanding of that graphite epoxy honeycomb, what heat does to that. So we're going to go into our radiant heat facility and we're just going to heat that graphite epoxy up, a cavity about the same size as we're talking about here, four by six inches. And, uh, and we're going to test it just to see the impact on that honeycomb epoxy. It'll be some good data to have. I don't think it will be relevant to what we're going to see on, uh, on entry. The, uh, only other real topic of discussion that we had was um, uh, after we decided on EVA-3 was uh, the discussions about the attitude control system on the space station and Mike and his team briefed us and, uh, and we just talked through that and, and, uh, and talked over different options for, uh, for potentially staying an extra day and what that would take and, and, uh, and that was about it for the MMT today. Rob? Thanks, John. Okay, we'll take questions. Uh, Jeremiah, let's start over here with Bill Harwood and we'll, we'll work around. Uh, Bill Harwood with CBS with two from Mike. Um, I just need to bound this to make sure I understand what the issues are. What, what happens, just so I know, I think I do, but just do I know what happens if you don't get them up and you have to leave? What does that do? Um, and the second question is, when would you have to make a decision about a Group C power down or something like that to get the extra day? How long can you go before you have to decide something? Thanks. Let's see. The, I'll do the, the second one first. We need to, 
we're deciding that now so that we have a chance of getting the extra O2 we need. So within the next uh, few hours or the first part of tomorrow, I expect we will find ourselves looking at reducing uh, some some of the loads on the on the shuttle in order to get us uh, the additional O2. Uh, the latter is we have to have propulsion of attitude control even with CMGs. That's um, the CMGs do a great job, but occasionally they get saturated. And when they get saturated, then uh, we need propulsive attitude control in order to, to recover. Um, the other, of course, need for propulsion is to make sure we can do debris avoidance maneuvers, to adjust our orbits for dockings. There's a number of reasons why we need propulsive uh, attitude control and translation capability. Uh, so that's a requirement of the ISS, and uh, and so we have to have that capability. Does that answer your question? Oh, it did, but, but it did. But if you would state what that, what if you don't? What do you mean when it's a requirement? Does that mean you have to unman the thing? I mean, well, you know, we'd have to talk about all that. Uh, we. Um, we, there's a lot of techniques we've created along the way as we've flown the ISS. Recently, we did um, we did a maneuver all on uh, on CMGs, which we hadn't done in the past. Uh, generally speaking, when we used to use the CMGs for maneuvers, which we've done, we get we start a maneuver, and when we get to the end, we need the, the we needed the jets just to, to stop us. Basically, the CMG saturated. Well, we recently maneuvered the space station. In fact, two or three times, I believe, where we start started the maneuver, went, did the whole maneuver, and stopped the maneuver all on CMGs. Um, so we, we would look at all types of techniques to, to buy ourselves some time. Um, we can always, like any critical problem, we can always leave ISS if we need to. Um, whether we would leave the ISS in, in this situation, I don't know, because we're always in a better config if we can keep the crew around to help us out. Um, so. Um, you know, I know what you want me to, want me to say, but I would tell you I haven't I haven't worked through it. I do not expect uh, that in the next couple three days we won't be sitting here telling you that we've got these computers back and we've we've kind of understand why that occurred. I just don't see that as being a scenario by the time our shuttle friends leave. Uh, if we are in that position, we have an option to depart. We always have an option to do that. Uh, that's this is not the only scenario that we could find ourselves doing this. There's a number of different. Uh, critical situations that could occur where you'd have to uh, unman ISS, but I don't expect this to be one of them. But that would be the worst case scenario. Mark. <laughs> I'm Mark Crow, Houston Chronicle. I think I'm following up on a couple of points here, but is, th is this a software problem or hardware problem on the shuttle where there are spare part? I'm sorry, on the station where there are spare parts? And then I have a follow-up to that, please. I, I, if I knew that, Mark, I'd be sitting here telling you how I was going to fix it. Okay, thank I, you. I guess I could tell you, um, this appears to be, I would tell you from my, from my knot hole, this appears to be um, something that has occurred over the last few days. So that would tell me that the, all three computers didn't just all have a hardware failure, although we did suffer something similar to that. Uh, several flights ago on the on the ISS side. Um, it appears to me that something has changed in the environment, either something in the environment or the uh, the source of power now to these computers is is different coming from S34 that that for reasons that we're not we do not understand. Um, it could potentially be software, although we have not uplinked a software change, but perhaps something happened to the software. We can always reload it, and of course we will talk about that option. Um, I'll tell you, our Russian colleagues believe it's the power source. That's the latest theory they have. Uh, they've suggested to us that we, um, uh, they have suggested that perhaps, and we will look at this, perhaps we could uh, disconnect from, we, we will stop feeding them power and let them just use their own internal power to bring up their computers and see if that solves that particular problem. Um, they cannot run on their own power we, because of all the systems that run to, to, to handle the entire crew. Uh, we have to feed them a certain amount of power to, to keep everything running that we need to run. Uh, so eventually we'd have to work through that. Another option that we're working through is just 
stop feeding them power from S3 Trust, which is uh, maybe the first thing we'll try. But we're still sorting through our plans. But I don't think the hardware has magically, all six computers, which are all similar, um, I don't think that's the problem. I would suspect it's either possibly software or some external uh, cause that we've got to sort through. And I believe at some point would not the shuttle, which is there to provide attitude control, I guess, through this situation, uh, does not does it not run out of prop, and th therefore it's not that useful uh, for attitude control. And when when does that happen, if that's a factor? Well, it's extremely useful because we don't ever require any prop-related system to provide attitude control all the time. We're on CMGs right now. We've been on CMGs uh, for the most of today, if not all of today. Have we been on CMGs? All of today. So the other day, the, the, the day before yesterday when we were deploying arrays, it had to do with the amount of change in momentum. The CMGs couldn't handle the arrays going out. And what set of thrusters we use to control the stack because uh, certain thrusters point a certain direction and, and depending on which array was going out, one was worse. So at one point we had the Russian segment backing up CMGs. In the other case we had the U.S., I mean we had the uh, uh, the shuttle with verniers actually doing the attitude control. Um, at one point we we went into free drift and we just stayed there for a little while. All of that was based on major momentum changing events. Um, the next couple of, of attitude maneuvers or momentum changing events are uh, the Sarge. When we first activate the Sarge, obviously until the restraints are done we won't be moving the Sarge, so we've got a couple, three days before we even have to talk about that now. Uh, but we were going to hold off on that. We don't need to activate the Sarge right away. So we were going to hold off on that. The other one is we had to do an attitude maneuver, do a dump. We'd planned to do a wastewater dump uh, tomorrow. We've postponed that for a little while uh, while we sort through this. So we don't have anything that requires us to do attitude maneuvers, and therefore the CMG should be okay. If the CMGs have a problem, what typically will happen is they'll saturate. The, uh, in this case, the shuttle will take over the load. It will. Uh, take out the rates, it'll settle it all down and the CMGs will take back over. So you're absolutely right. And we've gotten some numbers about how long it would take and we're off working with our shuttle friends to 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 pick attitudes and and thruster combinations to get us as much a time as possible. But we, we can't have 24 hours of uh, propulsive control every day and shoot, I can't do that with the space station either. You just, that's why the CMGs there. And the CMG, that's typical. CMGs are typically the device that are holding attitude in space station, unless we're doing major events like attaching solar arrays and, I mean, deploying solar arrays, attaching trusses, stuff like that. I don't know, John, if you want to comment more or not. Let's go to Gina and then Todd. Gina. Um, Gina Sinceri, ABC News for Mike. Mike, uh, describe these computers for me. I mean, and they're in the Russian segment. Describe them for me, and I mean, is this like booting up my laptop here? What's involved? And then, have you ever seen this before, this kind of failure? Um, let's see, I don't know how to describe these to you. No, nothing we do on space station is like booting your laptop other than booting our laptops, and which we do have a lot of on space station. So um, I've, I've never actually commanded a Russian segment computer before, so I don't exactly know the steps you take, but it's a, it's a, it's a mill standard type computer. It's actually a European built computer that uh, was provided by the Europeans years ago as part of the, as part of the process of building up the, uh, 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 the service module. But it's, uh, it's not any different than any other computers in general. I mean, they're not exactly the same as, as, uh, as the computers we have, but they're very similar in capability. They're, they're Western style computers. Um, but they'd be just like, if you saw one of our computers, it's a, just a black box with big connectors on the end. It doesn't look like anything. Um, and the actual steps, I don't know, but they're, they're fairly uh, simple. I mean, you, you, uh, you, you send a command to it to go off and reach into a certain part of memory to activate a, a, a certain piece of software. A lot of things your laptop does for you, we, we would do manually. Just tell, go get this code, go activate this code. Then the software starts running, it brings things up. And then we generally have to reconfigure it. We need to tell it what configuration we're in, what to expect, things like that. Uh, but it's not typically a lengthy process. And in the case of the Russian segment, whenever we lose the third lane, so, so I'll start by saying we're, Rarely do we have all three lanes up on 
either the guidance or the command and control. We, they lose sync over time and then that one stays out and then in the, the two that are remaining will lose sync and then one will be up. And then when that last one loses sync, it's automated. The process of bringing them back up is, is automated. And so the system goes up, it reboots all three of them, they all get synced back up and then they move on. And then the ground has to do a few things to uh, tell it again the configuration of the ISS. But it's a totally, if, if you're letting the system do it, so you can do it totally hands off. This is what did not occur. This is probably the most interesting event. It wasn't that we were down to a single lane as much as when we lost the, the one computer, the final computer of the three, the system went in to reboot itself and tried two or three times and was not successful. And so that's probably what's unique. So, so I would tell you that in, in the history of the program, we've, we've, until this flight, we had not been without all three computers for any length of time. We've had the last one fail and it reboot and bring them all back in the set and that's a pretty, that, that happens pretty quickly. Uh, we don't really know, I mean it occurs, we know it occurs, but if, if attitude control is being handled by the Russian segment, it picks back up with attitude control and we don't have to do much. Um, so, so it's not insignificant that we've had one or two down. What is insignificant is, what is significant is that we've been uh, without all three, which we haven't been until this flight. This is the first time we've spent a long period of time without all three computers, and certainly without all three computers on both sides. Todd? Uh, yeah, Todd Halverson of uh, Florida Today. Um, I was, I was wondering, I don't think you answered the one question about whether there were any spares on board in terms of these uh, command and control or GNC uh, computers on the Russian side. And um, I was also wondering if, if you can't get them fixed, you stay in this exact same configuration and the shuttle has to leave, how long can you hang around without a propulsive capability up there? I, uh, let's see, I'll answer the first one. I don't know, I haven't asked if we have spares, but I will tell you our Russian colleagues typically have a spare for everything that's on orbit. Uh, again, you don't need all three. The job can be done with one. So from our perspective, if they, if they have two, they have one spare and, and one computer. So, but I haven't asked that question specifically, so I don't know if we have a spare in addition to the three that are in, any, in, in the one set. Um, the other question it's hard to answer right now. If, if uh, the first thing that has to happen when we, when a shuttle leaves is we have to handle the transient of the shuttle departure. Typically that requires a desaturation uh, requiring uh, thruster control on the Russian segment. So the very first thing we'd have to do is figure out how to deal with uh, a departure. So I mean immediately we'd be trying to figure out how to keep the vehicle uh, stable without propulsive attitude control. Mike. Uh, hi, Mike Schneider, Associate of Press. Question for John. If you could uh, just explain the rationale for choosing uh, the third spacewalk instead of the fourth spacewalk for the uh, blanket repair. Well, let's see, we talked it uh, through for quite a while, and, and if you remember, I told you yesterday that the, uh, the team was, uh, was had pretty much 100% consensus that we needed to uh, to do a repair to to prevent any damage to the flight hardware, and uh, we we talked about it. It fit in either EVA, and uh, and uh, after after discussing it for a while, we kind of came to the point that this is something that we need to go do. It's a pretty high priority, and uh, we would hate to pass up uh, an opportunity while we're EVA uh, to go do it. And um, the ops team uh, is, is pulling together all the procedures and the training required for the crew on orbit. And uh, I expect that they'll be able to make the Friday EVA. If they don't, uh, or if they run into some kind of a hiccup or the crew is busy doing something else, uh, then the team would be very comfortable uh, doing it on EVA 4. Um, but we just thought the uh, the first opportunity was uh, was a good one, and, and we'd like to take it. It also it it provides two additional things. It's it's two less days that you're flying around with this blanket that's uh, that's up, and uh, and the other one is if something doesn't go right on EVA three, you've got another chance on EVA four to do it again. So that was kind of the rationale that went into it. Uh, it's late, so we're going to take about one or two more questions. So Mike, did you have a follow up? You all decide that uh, the shuttle should stay an extra 
some some extra time at the station. How many more days past what is now, um, I guess, the undocking day? Could you all stay up there? Well, one is easy. Um, the uh, if you remember, we just extended by two days our, our docked time frame, and the uh, the limiting consumable for me is cryogenic oxygen, which feeds the fuel cells, which provide power to the shuttle. And I had 18 hours of, uh, of cryo for uh, feeding those fuel cells above the 13 plus two, which that's my two extension days for weather, for landing. Um, 18 hours is getting pretty close to 24. We were supposed to, um, to uh, provide 40 pounds of oxygen to the ISS, and we were gonna do that on flight day seven. We decided at the uh, MMT today to wait until flight day nine, I think, and Kelly can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, to uh, uh, transfer that to, to ISS. And if it turned out that we needed that extra dock day, we just use that 40 pounds, and that would just about give us an extra day on orbit. Um, if you were gonna go past that one additional day, uh, past uh, next Wednesday, then you talk about eating into your uh, contingency days that we typically use for, uh, for landing weather problems. So that'd be a much more difficult decision. Jim and Tarek, and then we'll call it a day, Jake. <laughs> Okay. Uh, actually, for, for Rob, do you have any kind of training materials or pictures of these computers that we can get overnight? Uh, we'll search uh, for the computer pictures. Uh, nothing readily available, but we'll take a look. It'll okay. be gray, a box with big connectors on the outside. And it says, have you just your machine? Yeah, okay. In terms of EMI, you, I, I just chasing down EMI comes, comes to my one of my nightmares. And uh, have you looked at, in terms of external EMI? Have you, how much uh, have you had an experience in the past on ISS, for example, of, of getting a reaction from ground radars that may be pulsing you at high power? Uh, there are some new ground radars out there in the past six to twelve months that have been watching the station, and I don't know if you have you have you seen anything like that. Well, I'll tell you that we're looking at all sources, including external sources, uh, and they can come from. Uh, from off of the planet as well as on the planet. So we'll look at all sources of any sort of radiation that might be occurring on board ISS. And finally, Tarek. Thank you, Tarek Mack with Space News and Space.com. For Kelly, I just kind of had a question about how the station crew is working through this problem with the folks uh, at Russia's uh, MCC. I mean, how much work do they have to divert because they are handling the computers? I guess what's the impact to them uh, personally? Actually, it's been very little impact in terms of the mission. Um, we've got a very well integrated crew. And so um, while the shuttle crew has been busy with the spacewalk today, um, we did have the station crew who was able to work with Moscow and help them out uh, for power downs and different activities. So it's been a very, uh, uh, just an excellent crew working together to get all the things that we need to get done to get finished. So it's, it's went really well. Okay, that'll wrap up the questions. Uh, we're going to get the briefers out immediately because they still have a lot of work to do tonight. Just two quick programming notes. Uh, shortly after the briefing com concludes, we'll be broadcasting the video taken by the cameras on Atlantis' solid rocket boosters during its climb to orbit last Friday. That'll be on NASA TV. Our flight day highlights package with all of the video from today's activities will be broadcast on NASA TV at midnight central time, 1 a.m. Eastern time, and replayed throughout the crew's sleep period. With that, have a good evening, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. Thanks a lot.